Um, I'm talking about profiling the FreeBSD kernel boot here. Um, the subtitle there from, from Hammer Time to Start in it. Uh, when I first started planning this talk, it was going to be from MI Startup to start in it. But uh, after I started profiling things, I realized, in fact, there's some significant time being spent in Hammer Time as well, so I adjusted the subtitle. Um, so why should we profile a FreeBSD kernel boot? Um, in a sense, there's, a, there's a, an obvious answer to that. We, wa we want to know what takes how much time. Uh, so I, I realized as I was putting together my slides on the way to Tokyo, where I first gave this presentation, um, the, the more interesting question is, why did I profile FreeBSD kernel boot? Um, so, so last summer, I, I bought a new laptop, the, what, the one I'm using here. Um, I, I use FreeBSD on my laptops. Um, a, a lot of FreeBSD developers are still using uh, Apple laptops running OS X. Um, sorry, it's called Mac OS now. They keep on changing things. Um, but uh, I, I insist on using, using FreeBSD. And we've had issues with video support traditionally. Um, and the uh, Intel video driver had some issues with my, my laptop. So I spent a few months trying to get things working smoothly, which involved a lot of loading the kernel module, seeing what panicked, going and looking at the code, making some changes here and there to try to figure out what was going on, recompiling it, rebooting, seeing another panic. So, yeah, so several hundred cycles through this process. And um, somewhere around reboot number 100, I started to notice things as it was rebooting. Um, sitting there watching all this text scroll by, and, and you know, you, mostly it's scrolling by pretty fast, but sometimes it stops for a while. So I started wondering, so what's it doing when it stopped at this point? So based on the stuff it's printing out, you, you, you get some idea of, of what's going on. Um, so I was a, able to make some educated guesses. And then I, I threw in a few printfs say, so to let me know, you know how, what, what, what's the, the CPU cycle count at this point in the process, at this point in the process, at this point in the process. And you know, a, a few places, it's, it didn't take long to, to figure out. Um, there, there's a few, fu few functions where it was taking a very long time to execute, uh, just because I could see the, the cycle count increased a lot from, from entering that function to exiting it. So the VM page array initialization, I, I noticed, was taking a while. And actually, that one I didn't notice on my laptop, but I noticed it on a, a large EC2 instance. Um, calibrating the, C the CPU clock, calibrating the APIC timer, probing and initializing the mouse. Um, but yeah, as I was going through, I, I realized there were some things that were obvious just as it was booting messages going by, but I, I did need something more systematic um, rather than only annotating things when I, when I got suspicious about them. So the FreeBSD boot process um, starts when you hit the power button or I guess plug in a system if it turns on automatically. Um, you go into some sort of, of system firmware, BIOS, EFI, UEFI, U-boot, um, um, different systems. Um, those will generally load some sort of FreeBSD bootloader. It might be on the, the first sector of the disk or various other places on different systems. Um, depending on what sort of system you're running, you may have one bootloader, you might, might have several bootloaders, the first boot zero loads boot one, which loads boot two, which loads slash boot slash loader. But eventually, one of them will load the kernel. Um, control gets passed to the kernel at that point. Um, I see Kirk looking at this very intently. I'm sure he's going to tell me I'm, I've got this wrong. But uh, <laughs> the FreeBSD kernel starts running. Uh, there's some, some machine-dependent initialization code. Um, on AMD64, it, it's the hammer time function. Um, and uh, once the machine dependent initialization runs, uh, then you go into MI startup, which is the machine independent startup function. Um, that it does the bulk of, of the initialization of the kernel. Um, at the end of that, um, you end up calling into start init. Um, to be technical, start init is, is entered halfway through MI startup, but it, it 
need to pick up the giant lock, which isn't released until we get to the end of MI Startup. So there's, there's, a, there's a little bit of overlap between the two, but for practical purposes, MI, uh, MI Startup finishes before Start in it runs. Um, and uh, one of the things that Start in it does is it, it mounts the root file system because you need to have the root file system there before you can actually run a program off of it. Um, after start in it, you have in the in it process running um, in it for now, maybe system D later. Um, <laughs> but for, for now at least, uh, in it, it, it runs uh, and then uh, on FreeBSD we, we run a bunch of RCD scripts um, which launch all of the user land systems. So for this talk, I'm looking at the FreeBSD kernel initialization. Uh, so I'm not looking at the bootloader. I mentioned that the, in the FreeBSD developer summit, I, I'm hoping that somebody will help me uh, figure out why the bootloader takes so long, but I don't want to do that all by myself. Um, and I'm not looking at the user land initialization. I know there's some people who are interested in speeding that up. But again, uh, I, I'm, I'm only attacking the kernel initialization myself. So first thing I did was, was look at what other systems were doing. So Linux. Um, by default, on most, most Linux systems, when you boot up, you get timestamps printed at the beginning of each line of kernel output. So looking at this, it, it's, it's easy to see that something like uh, 74 milliseconds are spent somewhere between ACPI sleep button SLPF and input IMEXPS2 generic explorer mouse. Um, not sure exactly what's going on in there, but but you know that that 74 milliseconds is happening somewhere at that point. And then another 136 milliseconds between discovering a mouse and mouse dev, whatever that is. Um, but it makes it really easy for users to notice. You know, if, if there's a big gap between the numbers, something's going on there. And you know, in a sense, this is, this is good because Things happen in, in the open source community because users notice things and they complain and they say, hey, why is my system stuck for so long at this point in the boot process? Um, but there are some downsides to this approach that Linux takes. Um, you only get these messages printed when something's being printed. Um, there, there's, it, it takes the, the existing system for, for printing output to the console and just sticks timestamps at the beginning, beginning of it. So, if nothing happens to be printed at some important point in the kernel boot process, then you're not going to get a timestamp for it. Um, that's less of an issue on Linux than it is on BSD because the Linux kernel is quite verbose in what it prints during boot. Um, but it certainly would be a problem for, for FreeBSD if, if we only relied on, on uh, adding timestamps to the existing um, printfs. Uh, much worse problem is um, because it's actually printing wall clock times, um, at, when the system first boots, it, it all it has is the CPU timestamp counters. It doesn't know how fast that clock is running. And so it just prints a bunch of zeros because how to uh, translate the, the CPU cycle count into a wall clock time to print. So if we instead record the cycle counts and then translate them later, then we can actually get the cycle counts for those early parts of the boot process which Linux is just printing zeros for rather unhelpfully right now. So next thing I looked at, well, dtrace, you know, if you're doing anything on FreeBSD and you want to profile it, the first thing anybody says is, well, why don't you use dtrace? Um, but uh, dtrace is a, a very sophisticated system, and it has all the encumbrances of very sophisticated systems. It relies on traps. It uses memory allocation. It uses thread scheduling, probably a whole bunch of other things. Um, I want to profile stuff before we have traps or memory allocation or kernel scheduling. So <laughs> Dtrace just isn't going to be able to handle that. Um, yeah, there are some things that Dtrace could be used for in, in terms of kernel profiling uh, because you can load, boot, boot the kernel with Dtrace enabled and even provide a, a Dtrace script that runs automatically at boot. So you could profile sort of the, the second half of the kernel boot using Dtrace. Uh, get whatever is happening after Dtrace is initialized. But I wanted something that could handle the entire kernel boot process. So Dtrace just wasn't going to be it. Um, KTR is, is a, another nice system that, that the FreeBSD kernel has for, for locking kernel events. Um, it's a very simple system. 
you call a function, give it some parameters, and they go into a buffer. And they just sit there until you dump them out later. Um, basically what I needed, except uh, it uses a circular buffer, because KGR is really designed for something is making your system crash, you want to log things that are happening, and then after your system crashes, you can look in that buffer and see what happened just before we crashed. Um, for profiling a kernel boot, I don't want to know what just happened. I want to know what happened at the beginning of the, of the boot process. Um, the buffer size is also really small. I, I needed much more than 1,024 records. Uh, and it, there are a few minor issues with KTR that mean that it can't run at the very beginning of the boot process. Uh, it, one example, it uses cur thread, which isn't initialized until something like a thousand clock cycles into the boot process. So it, it, it's available almost at the beginning, but not quite. Um, so these limitations, I, I could have worked around them, but I would have had to hack up KTR a bit, and I would have been worried if I, I hacked it up, it might, it might have broken it for other purposes. So it, it was just easier to add a, a new system specifically for, for the, the boot profiling that I was doing. So that's the TS log system. Um, those, those two files together are maybe 150 lines of code. Um, you compile a kernel with the options TS log, uh, and then uh, there will be a buffer specified at compile time. By default, uh, 256,000 records. There's a, a, an option for changing that, uh, again, at compile time. Um, every time you want to log a record into here, um, you, you call a function, and that function atomically reserves a slot, um, and then just fills that slot with the, the, uh, the parameters that you, you pass to it. Um, when, you, when it hits the end of that buffer, um, it says, oh well, we've, hit, we've filled the buffer, we're just going to throw away this, this data you gave us. Um, each record, there's a, a cycle count, which the TS log gets just from the, the CPU, um, a thread ID, uh, a record type, and then uh, one or two strings. These strings are passed as pointers, um, so there isn't any sort of string manipulation inside TS log. Uh, until you get to the point of dumping things out at the end. Um, there's, there's convenient macros to make it easy to uh, insert these into your code. Uh, and then, uh, yes, after the system has booted, so w while it's booting, everything is being logged in, inside the kernel, and then after it's booted, uh, there's a simple syscall that just dumps everything from that buffer out to whatever program you have in user land, and then you can process it, visualize it however you like. So most of what we want to know about what's taking a long time can be, we can figure that out just, just from knowing when we entered certain functions and when, when we exited them. So two simple macros uh, defined in, in TS log H, the TS enter and TS exit. Um, these macros uh, just record a, a, a record type. Um, we are entering a function, we are exiting a function, and then the name of the function. Um, so I take these, I just throw them throughout the, the kernel in places that I think will be useful. Uh, so obviously, starting from the top, hammer time, MI startup, start init. These are important functions. They're, they're a big part of the, the boot process. So I want to know when we enter those and when we exit those. Um, some functions uh, at the lower level that get called a lot, delay. If, if we're spending a lot of time just spinning our wheels, waiting, some number of milliseconds, I, we definitely want to know that. Um, vprintf, that's, there's a, there's a number of functions in the, the printf part of the um, file in the kernel, but all of them end up going through underscore vprintf before something goes onto the kernel uh, console log. So that was a convenient one to, to insert these into. Uh, and yeah, we, we print things from all over the kernel. Um, Sysinit routines, these are all of the routines that are called from MI startup to do things to, to set up the kernel. Um, device probe and attach functions, this will tell us if, if any hardware is taking a long time. Uh, and then VFS mount, because sometimes mounting a file system takes a while. So this is an example of what it looks like. This is the, the x86 delay function. Um, so at the beginning, I call TS enter. At the end, I call TS exit. Uh, 
And then in the middle there, before return, I also call TS exit. Um, these are simply macros, so they turn into code, or if you don't have TS options, TS log enabled in your kernel configuration, they just compile to nothing at all. Uh, they go away. So there's, there's no, no performance impact, no, no impact at all um, on the kernel uh, if you do not have the options TS log enabled. Um, but because we are just writing simple C code here, um, there's no way to say automatically call TS exit when we leave the function. There are ways to do that sort of thing in C++. You can have a, something that, that calls the structure automatically when it goes out of scope. Uh, but yeah, we're not doing that in the kernel. So if you're annotating a function which has several possible return paths, you need to insert the TS exit in, in several places. Um, so sysinits, um, I mentioned that these are basically all the work that MI Startup runs. Um, it's a way that any part of a kernel, uh, uh, kernel modules or just any file anywhere in the kernel can say, this is something that needs to be done when this kernel boots up. So there's a name, there, there's, there's two ordering parameters, and, and these are sorted first by the first ordering parameter and then by the second if, if to break ties. Um, there's a function and there's, there's a value that gets passed to that function. Um, Linux init calls basically work the same way. Um, FreeBSD is slightly more sophisticated. We, we have more ordering stages. Uh, I think in Linux, everything goes into seven different stages, and FreeBSD, we have something like 100 different stages in a kernel. Um, and then they only have one ordering parameter, we have two. But it's, it's essentially the, the same mechanism. Um, all of these end up in a, a special ELF section of the kernel, and then the, the linker uh, is able to go through that, that ELF section and, and pull out um, all, all of the stuff defined in that ELF section, um, which allows MI Startup to get a list of all the things that were defined um, as sysinits from all over the kernel. Um, it, it's, it's really cute. It's, it's horribly unportable. Uh, but of course, FreeBSD would, it's FreeBSD. We, we don't need to worry about whether our code can run on Linux. Um, so it, when, you, when you run with the, the TS log kernel option uh, enabled, um, sysinit is just a macro, which does all the work of creating the, these structures. So I just redefined the sysinit macro. Um, so instead of calling the function you specified, it calls a different function. Um, so I have a, a shim function uh, and an extra structure which says, this is the thing that we're really calling. And then the shim function just um, logs, we are about to enter this, this function, then it calls the function, and then it logs, we just exited from that function. Um, here you, you'll see um, a, a function, a macro called TS raw. Um, this, this allows me to say, um, instead of just logging the name of the, the function um, as, a, as a single string, I, I log sys in it and the name of the function. It just makes it easier to, to see when things get dumped out at the end. Um, which things are sysinits and what, which things are something else being locked in the kernel. Um, TS enter and TS exit are the, the names of, of the, the record types being logged. Uh, so device probe and device attach routines, uh, a lot of the, the kernel boot is spent in those. Um, so in fact, these, these are called from a sysinit. Uh, it's called configure2. I'm not sure why it's configure two rather than configure one or just configure. Um, there may be some historical BSD reasons for this, um, but in any case, the, the configure two sysinit uh, recurses through all of the, the system buses attached and looks for devices. And this, this works recursively, so if it finds a device which is a PCI, PCI bridge, then it will then look on that bridge. Is there anything attached to you? Oh, there's a PCI bus attached to you. Okay, let's. Now look on that PCI bus that's attached to you. Is there any, anything attached to that PCI bus? So it, it recurses through the system. Um, eventually, hopefully, if nothing's broken, finds all the devices. And um, every time it, it gets somewhere, it, it calls device probe functions to say, hey, look for whatever de device you're able to handle. Um, tell me if you find it. 
Um, and, and then once something's found, uh, or, or, or once a driver says, yes, I know what to do with this piece of hardware, rather, uh, then device attach so, uh, allows a particular driver to, to claim that device and start using it. Um, so drivers declare their, their probe and attach methods by the dev method macro. Uh, method, you know, when we talk about methods, we're, we're usually thinking object-oriented programming, and yes, the FreeBSD kernel is object-oriented. Uh, if, if you want to have nightmares, read the kobj man page. Um, is Warner in the room? Okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, yes. Uh, yeah, well, I, it, it was other, other stuff related to this that Warner did. Um, but yes, um, it, it is a very interesting system. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it works right. It, it, it is vaguely reminiscent of C++. It, it, it works very well. Um, it's, it, take, it took me a long time to figure out how it works, though. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, so, the, so the, the device probe and device attach and similar functions, uh, they're actually inline functions in a header file, which is generated at build time from a .m file. These are basically your, your generic object dispatch method routines. So um, they, they get past a, the, the object, and they look in that object to, to find the appropriate function that you're trying to call, and then they call it. Um, make op, 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 um, is a, an awk script which, which takes these .m files and produces the, the .h and some .c files. Um, so I, I made some, some small tweaks to that, uh, and then I, I annotated device if.m. Uh, no, I didn't put that site in there. Um, so ba basically, um, inside the device if.m defines all of the routines for the, the device probe and device attach methods. Um, and I, I just put some annotation in there so that the, the dispatch methods for device probe and device attach will do the same as I did with sysinits. They will log, we're about to enter this, this routine, they'll call it, and then they'll log, we just got back from there. Um, VFS mount, um, so many things in FreeBSD are macros. Uh, this too is a macro, um, and it was very easy to annotate, just um, this, is, this is a version with TS log, uh, actually no, I don't, didn't even need a different version, I just added the two TS raw lines in there. Um, Again, without options TS log, those just compile away to nothing, so it, it doesn't affect anything. You didn't just put it into the prolog and epilog that was already there? Uh, yes, there's a reason I didn't put it into the prolog and epilog. Um, first, the, the prolog and epilog are used for other VFS functions. I didn't want to be logging every VFS function, um, because that would fill up the logs very, very quickly. Uh, and also... There was, there was some other, I think the part of the prologue sometimes took a while. I, I, there, there was some other issue w which I ran into putting it into the prologue. So it was just easier to, to stick, it, stick it into VFS mount. So yes, I, I annotated that as well. Um, so that's telling us when we're entering functions, when we're, when we're exiting functions. Um, for any particular thread, that tells us where that thread is at any point in the kernel boot. Um, but when the kernel's got running multiple threads, um, sometimes you run into situations where one thread is just waiting for another thread to finish. Uh, so there's a sysinit uh, interconfig hooks, uh, which waits until uh, other threads have, have released hooks, um, which were established by calling out function. This is a system in, which is in place so that uh, when some hardware needs to be initialized, but it can't be initialized until you have interrupts running. Um, it's able to say, okay, I need to do something, but I need to do it later. Um, configure two runs before you have interrupts running. So all of the device probing, device attaching, you don't have interrupts. If you need interrupts to initialize your hardware, you can't do it at that point. So you have to create a thread, establish a hook saying, yeah, we need to do this at some point, uh, and then It'll come back to you later. Uh, then you have interrupts. Then you can do your initialization. And then you say, OK, we finished with this. You can go ahead and finish booting. Um, this is important, for example, 
if you have, I don't know, USB disks. Um, you need interrupts to run USB disks. Um, if you want your system to boot off of USB, you need those disks to be there before you try to mount your file system. Um, so it's necessary to make sure that uh, you, you're able to finish initializing that, that hardware uh, before you get to the end of all the startup routines and, and try to mount root. Um, Gwait idle um, waits for the geom event queue to be empty. Um, geom is a system where uh, a disk is detected and arrives in the system and then geom looks at it and says, oh, this looks like it's been partitioned. Okay, here's a bunch of partitions, now we'll look at each of those individually. Oh, this, this partition is uh, part of a mirror. Um, okay, well, okay, this partition over here is also part of the same mirror, okay. So we'll put those together, we, have, we now have a, a geom mirror. Oh, this is something that's encrypted, so, okay, well, we'll pass it over to Jelly and it will come back and say, okay, this, this is the actual disk which is encrypted and mirrored and on partition disks. Um, so while this is all going on, these are all, all, all these things that have been discovered and need to be tasted are all in the, the geom event queue. So you don't want to go on and, and try to mount your root file system until it's finished exploring all the disks and made sure it knows what you have there. Um, VFS mount root wait, um, similar idea, um, any part of the kernel can call root mount hold, and again, it basically just says, I'm doing something, wait until I'm finished before you go ahead and try to mount the root file system. Uh, at the moment, I believe there are two things that use this. Um, one of them is Jelly, which I don't think even needs to because I think it's being taken care of through Gwait idle, and the other is USB. And if you've ever seen uh, root mount waiting for US bus zero, that's why. Um, so, in any case, there's various places where, where we're waiting for some other part of the kernel to do something before we can proceed. Um, theoretically, I could get this out of the kernel scheduler, but that would get really complicated really fast because we need to dump which, th which CPU is running which thread and find out when we have a, a mutex we're waiting for. So I decided to go for something a lot simpler. Um, the places where I knew we were waiting for something to happen, I just annotated, we're waiting for something. And the places where other threads are marking, hey, you need to wait for me to do something, and then, okay, I'm done, you can go ahead, I annotated those as well. And then uh, I also recorded the names of uh, every time a, a kernel thread was created, um, so that then, when we got to a point where the main thread of execution was, was blocked, waiting for something, then I could just say, okay, who released that block, that, that hold? Um, okay, I know what, what threads that, that's called. I'll blame that on, on, on that time on that thread. Um, it's a bit of a heuristic here. Um, I, I assume that the thread which released the most recent hold is the one that was responsible for that hold. Um, starting at either when the hold was established or when the thread was created. This isn't quite perfect because there's times when a hold is established by one thread and then it does some work and then a different thread does some work and then a third thread does some work and then the third thread actually leads to the hold. And so it's sort of hard to, to track back which thread was responsible for that hold at all the different points in the, in the process. But it, it, gets, it does well enough to, to give us a sense of what's, what's going on. So, after we finish booting, uh, I dump all of these records, I sort them out into threads, I construct time-stamped pseudo-stacks. These aren't, again, they're not real stacks because they only have the functions that we specifically annotated, that we're we entering this, we're, we're exiting this. Um, so all the other functions in between, it doesn't have in there. It's not like a, a stack like you get if you're, if you're just doing a, a, a stack dump from the kernel. Um, but assuming we annotated things we cared about, um, it, it'll be useful. Um, so the kernel boot process, um, the way I'm defining it, um, it's thread zero, which eventually turns into swapper, um, and then it's thread one, uh, it process one in it um, up to the point where it enters user land. After it enters user land, I just say, okay, we, we've, we've exited. We haven't really exited, but from my perspective, we've exited, so, so I'll stop recording at that point. Um, 
all the places that boot holes occur, um, I use those heuristics to figure out which thread I'm blaming it on, and I take the stacks from that thread and just splice them on top of my, my the stacks. So I'll, I'll have a, a, a pseudo stack that says, okay, we're, we're running MI startup, then we're running this citizen, then we're, we're running this function, this other function, um, and then we're running this other thread. Um, so now we have a, a bunch of stacks covering the entire boot process. Well, again, anybody who, who does profiling on FreeBSD, we always use flame graphs for things, uh, but flame graphs actually not good for here because they, they take everything in sort of now alphabetical order. That's great if you're profiling a, a 10 second slice of the kernel execution because then uh, while the system is running, you've probably got a whole bunch of functions being called over and over again, and so you want to group them together so that every time you see the same stack, it gets put together into one slice. Um, here, in the kernel boot, far more often we have stacks that only happen once, uh, but we actually care what order they happen in. So flame charts are basically like flame graphs, but instead of sorting things alph alphabetically, it's just in chronological order. So this is what it looks like. Um, my laptop, this one I'm, I'm running on right now, um, is the, the graph at the top. Uh, that was running 11.1 release, I think. Um, and then uh, this is an, an EC2 instance at the bottom. Um, I, I hacked up the, the flame chart code a little bit uh, to add some colors. Uh, if You probably can't see, read the text from there, but the, the blue at the top uh, those are all when delay was called. And the green regions, those are vprintf. So you can see uh, on the, the East 2 instance, a lot of the time is being spent either running delay or printf. Um, my, on my laptop, the biggest chunk is that chunk at the end, uh, which in fact is root mount waiting for US bus zero. Uh, so at the top, my laptop is about 18 seconds, and the East 2 instance is about 11 seconds. Yes. Oh, you are here. Yes, Warner. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, the mount wait for US bus zero. Yes. Is your root on USB? Uh, no. My, so my, my laptop is running ZFS. Okay. So, uh, yeah, this is a, an interesting thing in the FreeBSD kernel I mentioned at the Developer Summit, but for people that weren't there, uh, if, your mount, if your root system file system is on UFS, then we try to mount it, and if it's there, we don't wait for USB. If your root file system is on ZFS, then we wait for all the USB disks to arrive first, for some reason. Yes? Uh, you mentioned someone else at least? Uh, so so the, the, the green time is in printf, yes. Uh, okay, so I, I should explain that. So, so this is the time being spent uh, within the printf function, but it's I including its, its children. So it's not actually time being spent like parsing the, the printf string and, and figuring out which, which characters go in what order. Uh, in fact, this is, this is all, almost all time being spent printing characters through the console. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a, a later slide. All right, I'll keep on going then. Um, so yes, where is it all the time going? Um, so on my laptop, um, biggest thing in nine seconds is waiting for US bus zero. Um, the next biggest thing, which in fact is the, the slice, the, the yellow slice just to the left of that big red slice, um, that's running jelly key derivation. Um, so I, I have encrypted disks on my laptop so I type in my passphrase when I, I start booting the system, and then it gets into the kernel. It needs to de decrypt the disks. Um, I think Alan is in the process of moving that all into the bootloader, so it only ha needs to happen once, and it won't be in the kernel. But sometime in, in the boot process, it is going to be spent um, just deriving the, the encryption keys used for the disk. Um, about two seconds being spent discovering the mouse. Um, I, had, I, I mean, I have a trackpad on here, so it, it is a device it needs to detect because the trackpad shows up as a mouse. Um, we spend uh, one second 
spinning, uh, calibrating the uh, kernel, the uh, CPU clock speed. Uh, we spend uh, about one second calibrating the uh, EPIC, is it EPIC timer? What, what, what are the other timers, anyway? Um, 720 milliseconds in vprintf here. Um, hammer time spends a while, and then you know, small things going down. Um, in total, about 19 seconds. On EC2, um, over three seconds spent printing stuff to the console. That's almost a third of the total boot time is spent printing stuff. Um, a second and a half probing the PS2 mouse, which, oddly enough, EC2 instances don't have PS2 mice, but we need to look for them anyway. Uh, <laughs> again, uh, one second spent on each of those two clocks. Um, ENA is a, a um, it's the elastic network adapter. It's a, a very high speed uh, network uh, adapter, which in fact Amazon created, designed just for uh, EC2 instances. Um, and then again, smaller amounts of time going down. Um, one thing you may notice if you look closely, uh, start APs is spending a lot longer on EC2 than it was in, uh, on my laptop. So a few notes here. Um, I, ran, I ran this on a few different EC2 instances. And um, some of these times stay pretty constant. Some of them depend on how big the EC2 instance is. So uh, vprintf, uh, for each additional CPU we had, we were adding another 35 milliseconds there. Um, start APs was uh, 41 milliseconds for each AP. Uh, AP here is auxiliary processor. So it's a CPU other than CPU zero, which is where we start booting the system from. Um, VMM was taking about 15 milliseconds for each gigabyte of RAM. Um, CPU MP is 10.4 milliseconds for each auxiliary processor. The other things in here stay pretty much constant. So I, once I knew where time was being spent, I thought I would start trying to speed things up. Um, so the first one I looked at was uh, VMM. What was going on in there? Well, it turns out this is initializing the VM page array, and we were going over that array three times, initializing different parts of the array. Uh, in fact, I think the first pass was zeroing it, and then we started initializing it. Um, turns out if you do everything in a single pass, it gets a lot faster. So uh, Mark, I, I think it took about three days between when I sent an email saying, hey, this is slow, can you speed it up? And when he came back with a patch saying, yes, this makes it about four times as fast. So thank you, Mark. Um, going from 15 milliseconds per gigabyte of RAM down to three and a half. Um, HPT uh, star, this is actually two different drivers, HPT NR and I can't remember the other one. HP, anyway, the, the, there's a company called High Point Technologies uh, I think we have five different devices from them that have drivers in the FreeBSD kernel. Um, there was something that they should have been doing in the, their device attach routine, which instead they were doing in the device probe. It was scanning the PCI bus looking for stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, it was taking about 330 milliseconds. Every time any x86 system booted, we spent 330 milliseconds probing for this device. Um, so I, uh, you know, not many people actually have these devices. I, I think the most recent one they shipped was about five years ago. Um, but I sent them an email, and uh, about a week later, they said, oh, yes, yes, we've figured out what's going on. Here's a new driver. So um, Jin committed that, and now the 330 milliseconds is less than 0.1 milliseconds. Um, so easy wins here. We just need to actually profile a kernel and figure out what's going on. Um, Start APs, uh, 41 milliseconds per AP. Uh, it turns out this is almost all spent printing messages to the console saying, hey, I'm alive. <laughs> all of these CPUs, uh, when they're launched, they were printing a message, identifying themselves, saying that they are now running. Um, this time, it, it, it's actually time being spent in vprintf, uh, but it shows up as start APs because what happens is the sysinit start APs broadcasts a message to the other CPUs saying, okay, you can start running now. 
Um, and then those other CPUs, um, they're not even running in a thread yet, um, but they announce themselves, they, they, they grab a lock and then they, they announce themselves. Um, and so the time they were spending in, in vprintf wasn't actually being properly identified because my uh, profiling code wasn't recognizing that start APs was actually waiting for these other CPUs to do things. So um, Warner committed something just uh, last week, I think it was. Um, instead of printing out all of these messages, uh, well, you, you get those messages if you boot with boot verbose turned on, but uh, by default now, we have a single line starting APs, and then we get the numbers, and only the numbers, um, not a, a whole line for each uh, auxiliary processor. So that cuts it down from 41 milliseconds per AP down to about three milliseconds, a oh, nice factor of 10 speed up. So between these, these three simple fixes, uh, that shaved about two seconds off of the EC2 boot time, and uh, a little bit off of my laptop as well. Uh, of course, my laptop, uh, 32 gigs of RAM, um, pretty hefty for a laptop, but it wasn't taking a huge amount of time uh, initializing VM page, and it only has four CPUs, so start APs, not a big problem there. So I have some, some works in progress. Um, vprintf, uh, big spent time spender in EC2. Um, most of the time here is spent when we print a new line character to the console. Because when we print a new line character to a console, we scroll. In fact, I first realized this was going on because I was looking at how long vprintf was taking. And oddly enough, for the first 112 lines that was printed on my laptop, it was really fast. And 112 lines happens to be the number of lines that I get on my laptop screen. Um, it's a nice high resolution screen. Um, before it hits the bottom of the screen, and then it starts scrolling. Um, so when you're scrolling, um, you know, it would be nice if we could just tell the, the video hardware, hey, start printing stuff from this point on the, in the text buffer. You can't do that. Instead, you have to rewrite the entire thing, uh, depending on your, your console. Um, in EC2, we have a, a virtual VGA console. Um, we have a, a text buffer in the, the you know, standard VGA early 90s hardware virtualized there. Um, and we print characters by stuffing one byte into the right place saying which character it is and, and another byte saying which color it is. Um, and when we scroll, there's uh, 80 by 25, so I guess 2,000 characters that we put each of those bytes one by one back onto there. And the, uh, every time we do this, of course, some virtual system uh, has got this uh, PCI bus write, uh, and it needs to do something with it. So then there's some code running on some processor somewhere, uh, not on, on our CPU, um, which is taking this byte and looking up, OK, what does that character look like? Let's figure out how to render this into, onto our virtual VGA screen. It takes about 35,000 clock cycles. And in fact, I mentioned that we draw the, we put the byte with the character, and then we put the byte with the color. In fact, each of those bytes takes 35,000 clock cycles. And we're doing them individually, so it takes 70,000 clock cycles. Um, this gets twice as fast if I simply take two lines, which each do one byte writes, and turn it into a single 16 byte, so it's 16 bit write. Because then the hardware is getting the character and the color at the same time. And it only needs to be draw that character once on the screen, on the, the virtual screen. On my laptop, uh, it's a different issue. Um, I have a, the, the frame buffer hardware here. So we're running in video mode, and we are rendering the characters. But I have a 3200 by 1800 resolution display. Uh, each of those pixels needs to be redrawn with the new character, or the appropriate part of the new character that, that's being drawn when we scroll. Um, most of the screen is blank at any time. I mean, it's a, my, my display is 400 characters wide. Most of the current stuff, the kernel logs, does not go that far across the screen. So most of the time when we're scrolling, we are, in fact, rewriting blank characters on top of blank characters. 
So, yeah, I, I have a work in progress that will fix this. <laughs> and, um, yeah, on, I, I've got it done for EC2, and it, it speeds it up down to uh, less than one second, and similar speeds up, speed ups on my laptop. Yes, Warner? Uh, unfortunately, no, we do not have a graphical blit option at that point. So w later in the boot process, uh, I load the, the Intel kernel, video kernel module, and then all sorts of things happen. But at the very beginning, we are running with the EFI frame buffer. I believe that EFI says there is an optional mechanism for having a blit, but it's it's not required to be there, and, and we don't look for it. Um, and, and I have a suspicion that the blit would still be spending a lot of time reading and writing. I, I did actually look at whether I could speed up scrolling by reading from the video memory and writing back to there, but that was actually even slower, just video memory being not main memory, um, or it might be caching issue, I don't know. But uh, it, it was still faster to redraw things, but even better if I re only read all the things that actually changed. Um, given that most systems these days boot quickly enough that you can't read the stuff as you're scrolling, would it be quicker to just page it? Maybe and just when you get to the bottom of the page, do the rest of the stuff? Is I, I considered um, not doing scrolling and, yes, instead either, either paging it or, or possibly just going back to the top and writing over things. Um, I, I thought that might upset too many users. And so I was, I was hoping I could make it fast without resorting to actually changing the user visible behavior. Did you get a handle on whether or not that was good when you Oh, uh, if, if we, did, if we mm -hmm. didn't worry about scrolling, just blank the screen and started writing from the top again, um, that would cut this down to effectively zero because like 99% of the time is spent on scrolling, not on actually writing new things. Sorry, over here. Uh, so I, I have not worked with server hardware. I work with my laptop and EC2. So, uh, my understanding is that uh, for you to get from for video to info, it's a serial book. So it's a serial console, which happens to be connected to a serial console on the PMC, which is then hooked up to your laptop and goes on the network. So I wasn't quite sure if you made this point that like. Uh, Okay, just, just for the, the recording, uh, there's some discussion here about serial ports and serial consoles and IPMI systems, and uh, the conclusion here seems to be that it, they're not a big issue. I can actually say with, with EC2, um, in addition to the VG, emulated VGA console, it also has a serial console, um, and FreeBSD is also writing all the stuff to the serial console. Very little of its time is being spent on the serial console. It's, the time is, is writing to the VGA. Okay, so so. So the question here is: is uh, instead of making printf faster, can we print less or uh, just not print things? So printing less, in fact, that's one thing we did. Um, Warner made the fix to to print a lot less when when new CPUs were booting up. Uh, in addition to the uh, the launching APs, uh, he also reduced the velocity of. Uh, there, there were a whole bunch of messages about attaching CPU drivers. Um, Warner, yes. Uh, 
Right, so th there, there's also an option. Uh, you can just tell the kernel, print to a, a null console, which, yeah, it, it, it is user configurable. You can just tell it, don't print anything at all. <laughs> So there's, there's, there's certainly, certainly options here. I, I, my, my concern was to have things faster by default. Um, I, I didn't think that we wanted to have the default being don't print anything because users get concerned if they turn on the system and nothing happens, especially if it breaks and nothing happens to tell them what broke. We could print something is happening, but... Uh, Okay, I'll take one more question and then move on. I only have 10 minutes left for the talk. Well, yes, there, there is a number of places that, that print things and um, yeah, some of them could just be logged somewhere else instead of going to the console. Um, again, that's sort of out of scope for what I'm dealing with here. Um, so I'll just uh, finish up quickly in case people want to have more discussions about serial consoles and so on. Um, so th these two one, one second delays, um, calibrating clocks, um, this is because somebody said, oh, we, we need to get a sufficiently accurate calibration. We have a clock to calibrate against, so we will just spin for one second, checking that the clock we're calibrating against, which is the, uh, I think it's the 8042, um, timer, the, the, the really old PC hardware um, runs at a bit more than one megahertz. Um, and we, we measure the clock before that, and we measure the, the clock at the end of that, and that time tells us how fast is, is the, the CPU timer running. Um, we can do a lot better than that. Uh, the approach that, I, that I'm implementing is to have a statistical regression. So basically, go it, spin in a loop and keep on measuring both clocks. Uh, imagine drawing those on a graph and basically draw a line through those points. The slope of that, of that line tells you the, the ratio of, of the clock speeds. Uh, and we can just, statistically speaking, we can get uh, a far more accurate value in far less time. Uh, so we, we, we can get the same roughly one part per million accuracy in 20 milliseconds instead of 1,000 milliseconds. Um, in fact, even less time for calibrating the the APIC, local APIC timer, because we can, cal can calibrate that against the CPU clock after we've calibrated the CPU clock. Um, so with these works in progress, uh, I've got the, the EC2 boot time from 11 seconds down to 5 seconds. A few more works in progress, uh, slightly less in progress. Um, the ENA driver was taking uh, 800 milliseconds to attach. Um, this is... It, in order to initialize the hardware, it needs to send some reset commands and then wait 100 milliseconds for responses to those or before it reads the response. Um, part of this is a, an issue with the design of how FreeBSD probes and attaches devices. Um, there's, there's no way for a device attached to say to return saying, I'm working on it. Uh, when device attach returns, it either has to return, I succeeded or I failed. Uh, and in this case and some other drivers, um, the driver authors want to finish initializing the hardware before they return saying, yes, I have succeeded. Um, if there's some way that we could return an, an in progress and then change that later, then this could ha all happen asynchronously while other parts of the boot process were proceeding. Um, but in the case of ENA, I, I wrote to Amazon about this and they got back to me saying, uh, yes, uh, we will work on this, a future version of the driver instead of uh, our future version of the hardware, instead of taking 100 milliseconds, will take 5 milliseconds. Uh, 
So that'll, that'll be a nice 20 volt speed up. Um, NVMe is taking 250 milliseconds to attach, and it's the same issue that uh, we, we, wait, we initialize the hardware before we return from device, device attach. Um, I think Warner is, is looking at either making it faster or taking it out of the critical path. So with those, it'll cut it down to about four and a half seconds. Um, then there's some things I want some help with. Um, the mouse, the keyboard, the time in hammer time is also in fact spent initializing, initializing the keyboard because somebody said, the kernel might panic really, really early in the boot process, and we want to have the keyboard available so that we can... I, I, don't, I don't know if GDB is actually running at that, available at, at that point, but we want to have the keyboard there. Um, so all told, about two and a half seconds being spent um, probing and attaching the keyboard and the mouse. Uh, this dates back to really early PS2 hardware. Um, there was an issue where if you, if you reset the PS2 keyboard controller, it would take up to 200 milliseconds for the voltage to stabilize before you could read a response back. Now, I don't know when any of you last used an actual PS2 keyboard. I suspect even PS2 keyboards from 10 years ago don't have the same issue as they had 30 years ago, 35 years ago, uh, of, of taking 200 milliseconds for voltage to stabilize. Almost all the keyboards we deal with, they're not actually PS2 keyboards, they're USB keyboards pretending to be PS2, or they're virtual machines that don't have any actual hardware at all. Um, but we still have this 200 millisecond delay, and uh, we need to reset the keyboard controller many, many times, uh, in particular probing for the mouse, uh, because the PS2 mouse is actually attached to the PS2 keyboard controller. You need to reset the keyboard controller Every time you look for a different type of mouse, because the way that you identify PS2 mice is to reset the keyboard controller and send a particular set of bytes to the mouse and, and see if it responds the right way. So I think there's seven different mice that we look for, and each mouse that we try to find takes 200 milliseconds of resetting the keyboard controller. So I'm hoping somebody else can, can take this on, uh, because the only hardware I ever use is my laptop and EC2. Um, I don't want to be the FreeBSD developer who broke everybody's keyboards. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, somebody who actually has a bunch of physical hardware and can test and make sure that they didn't break everybody's keyboards can uh, take on speeding this up. Uh, but if, if we can't do that, then at least I can speed it up in EC2 by just setting some hints in uh, the EC2 loader configuration saying, you know, you don't have a keyboard, you don't have a mouse, don't look for them. Uh, a few more things I'm looking for help with. Um, fixing the, the waiting for USB uh, when we're booting from ZFS. I think Warner might be looking on this, working on this. Uh, people who are looking his direction at the developer summit. Um, jelly key derivation. I mentioned I, ha I have two disks in my laptop. Um, they're encrypted using the same passphrase, but they actually have different keys. This doesn't actually do anything to add to security. So if we can set up the system um, so that if you have two disks using the same passphrase, it actually uses the same key, then it would be twice as fast because we'd only need to drive one key. Um, so I, I think Alan is working on this. And uh, with this, these two, and things I've mentioned before, that'll cut my laptop boot time from 19 seconds down to three seconds. So that will be very nice. Um, a few more speculative things. Um, when we uh, boot up with multiple CPUs, uh, the Intel multiprocessor spec says uh, you're, you're running on the, the boot processor to wake up a, an auxiliary processor. You send an init IPI, you wait 10 milliseconds, and you send a, a startup IPI. Right now, we, we do this to one CPU at a time. If you have two CPUs or maybe four CPUs, 10 milliseconds per CPU, not a big deal. 128 CPUs this is now taking 1.3 seconds. So I'm hoping there's a way that we can say send an init IPI to each CPU, and then wait 10, 10 milliseconds for all of them to do their waking up at the same time, instead of waking up, them up one by one. Um, John Baldwin might be working on this. It's not entirely trivial because we do things like setting global variables uh, before we wake up a CPU. So we need to find a way to, ident to, to, to let the CPUs as they're waking up identify themselves uh, without using a global variable, because otherwise, 
they would all think they're the same CPU. And also, they, they would all try to use the same stack. And if you have 127 CPUs trying to use the same stack, interesting things might happen. It might be fine because they're all going to be calling the same, the same function. But, <laughs> but as I say, yeah, interesting things might happen. So um, uh, I, I'm very happy to leave that in, in John's hands. Uh, and then the, the last thing I was, I was hoping somebody would tackle, um, when we have a lot of memory in, uh, available, um, 3.5 milliseconds per gigabyte of RAM uh, isn't much when you have a few gigs of RAM. It, it takes a while when you have four terabytes of RAM. Uh, and I think Amazon just recently announced they're going to have some instances with nine terabytes of RAM, um, which will take even longer. Um, so it would be kind of nice if we could start booting with, say, 16 gigs of RAM initialized and then initialize the rest of the M pages later. I mentioned this at the developer summit, and people look absolutely terrified. So I, I, I don't know if this is going to happen anytime soon. But it would be really nice uh, if somebody did want to take that on as a, uh, I don't know, maybe a, a PhD project, um, figuring out how, how to uh, initialize memory uh, after the boot process uh, starts running. So all of the, the TS log code is in the FreeBSD head. Uh, if you're running stable, I, I have a patch that I can give you for that. I, I haven't committed it, though. Um, the visualization code that produces those, those nice charts is in, on GitHub. Um, I've only tested this with hardware that I have access to, so again, my laptop and, and EC2. Uh, I'd really like to have people out there try this on their systems, because there are, there's going to be other hardware that takes a while to, to initialize, to probe, to attach. Um, other architectures, I'm sure there's going to be stuff out there. Um, so there's going to be lots of performance bottlenecks that I have not identified myself. So I'm, I'm hoping you will all go out and try this on your myriad different systems and uh, find out what the issues are. OK, I'm two minutes over time, but I think I have a few minutes for questions. So at the back there. It was December 31st in my time zone. It might be January 1st and some other time zones. Okay, so, so the question is, how should we change generic? That, that with the, the HPT drivers, that was actually what I was first planning on doing. Um, but then it turned out that they had a fixed driver, so I wasn't worried about it. Uh, I think Warner is going to tell us that he's going to take all of the devices out of generic uh, and have a minimal kernel and then load things based on matching PCI IDs. I just wanted to plug my dev match talk. <laughs> okay, yes, go, go, go to Warner's talk to hear about that. At the back here, yes? Uh, most of the boot process is serialized, so uh, all, all the, the fun, all the sysinets called from MI startup, they they're hold one by one. Yeah, it's it it so so MI startup calls device calls sysinets in the order that they're specified, and we have a lot of different stages specified in sysinets. So. Uh, and there are many places where uh, things are at a particular point because they know that they can't run until the thing just before them happened. So it may be possible to speed up. I mean, at the beginning of my startup, we don't have multiple CPUs. We don't have threads, so you can't run things in parallel. Um, some of it might be possible to run in parallel. But almost all the, the, the sysinets are really, really fast. I mean, less than a millisecond. So uh, it's really just a few that take a long time. So I, don't know if there's really much opportunity for parallelism. Parallelism in device probe would be kind of nice, but would require a bunch of restructuring and also brings up issues around device naming. Right. <laughs> yes? Um, I assume you tried uh, making the TS log use PPR. What did you find? Uh, what trouble did you run using PPR? Uh, were you here at the beginning of the talk? Yeah, I, I did. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, Part of it was just that KTR wasn't designed for this, so it, it has a, a limited number of entries in its buffer, so you'd have, need to make the buffer bigger. Uh, it's a circular buffer, so it only has the most recent stuff. I wanted the stuff at the beginning. Uh, and then uh, also it, it uses curl thread, so I'd need to hack it up so that when curl thread isn't available, because we don't have an indigenized per CPU structures yet, um, it wouldn't panic. Um, so, I mean, it, I could have made KTR do what I needed with some 
hacks, but it was easier just to throw in my own code. Okay, I think we're out of time, and if there's any more questions, talk to me later. Thank <laughs> you.